is covering the spread. Here are your hosts, Jim Sawness and Dr. Ed Feng. What is going on, everybody? Welcome on into Covering the Spread. That's right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and NumberFire.com. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for NumberFire.com, joined here as always by Ed Feng. You can find him over at ThePowerRank.com. Ed, it's been a tough week uh, throughout yeah. the, the earth. Uh, it's been a tough 300 years, you could argue as well. Um, <laughs> how are you doing right now? I'm doing all right. Uh, you, like you said, it's been been a tough week in the midst of a pandemic, and uh, some things just don't go away in our great country, uh, which cannot be so great sometimes. But uh, I hope everything gets better, and I'm yeah. looking forward to that soon. It's been nice to sit back and listen to people. I think that's been beneficial for me, uh, sitting back and reading different voices, reading what they have to say, reading you know why things have escalated and I think that it's beneficial to always in our in our lives read the opinions of other people you know because I grew up in a small town in Minnesota you're not going to get a lot of like education right. on non-white people growing up in a small town in Minnesota so I think it's been beneficial to just sit back and listen to people read their perspectives read about why Everything is where it is, and hopefully we can get the the change uh, in policing, get the change that we need, because it's not, it's good that people are angry. We need the anger and stuff like that. Um, so it's been good to sit back and listen, and hopefully everyone else has been able to like sit back and listen a little bit and read different perspectives and all that, just because I think that's kind of you know what we have to do right now, and uh, yeah. just just reading a lot, Ed, <laughs> which is something yeah. I know you like reading, so like at least that helps too. I do. I was actually yeah. listening on Fresh Air today. I think they uh, someone wrote a book about a similar racial uh, a black man getting killed in Baltimore. Yeah. And, you know, the book's coming out this month. I don't know why it's not out right now. Uh, <laughs> I don't know why you can't bump up your release date three weeks. Uh, right. But uh, it seems like some fortunate timing for that book. Yeah, absolutely. We might need to... Maybe we'll have to get a quarantine corner up about, you know, different literature we can read to educate ourselves on this, too. Uh, but sure. hopefully all of you just taking the time to read different perspectives and, you know, reflect on yourself as well, because that's always beneficial in times like these to realize how we got here and why we are here. As far as covering the spread for today, we're going to talk to Austin Cass. He is one of my colleagues over at NumberFire.com. He's one of our editors, and he covers the English Premier League. And, Ed, you've been watching the Bundesliga recently. but. Yeah. We're getting the EPL back on June 17th. Yeah, for sure. Uh, very exciting. I'm excited mostly for like more of my friends that follow the EPL. Uh, I'm still going to watch more German soccer because I like German soccer. Uh, I sat down on Saturday for uh, a match between Schalke, which I had mentioned as a team that I picked up because I really yeah. like the young American Weston McKinney. And uh, they were playing Werder Bremen, and I got even more excited because they have another – Bremen has another uh, young American, Josh Sargent, a forward. So I sat down. I was very excited. And then that was the worst half of soccer I've ever seen. <laughs> Both teams were awful. <laughs> and neither American played that well. And, uh, yeah, it was disappointing, you know. Like yeah. I did not – I mean, you know, uh, McKinney had just scored a pretty sweet goal the game before, like on a diving header – but just, I mean, his team is really bad. And, you know, Bremen actually scored a goal, which was pretty nice in that first half. But, you know, routinely just kind of passed the ball to the other team, which pretty sure is not what you're supposed to do. Not recommended. Yeah, not recommended. So I was actually tweeting at some people that, you know, watch a lot more of this, uh, wondering whether these teams are really bad or whether that was an awful first half. And the answer was yes on all three accounts. <laughs> so... Um, yeah, so anyways, that that was uh, you know, I got got a little better. I watched a little Bayern Munich a little bit later just destroy a team that didn't really belong on the pitch there. Uh, so um, but yeah, you know, unfortunately not too much hope for the US national team after <laughs> after watching that match. So, explain to an idiot like me what the difference is between German soccer and English soccer. You said you like the German product more. To explain to me as if I'm very stupid because in this, in this context I am wow, what's the difference there yeah I'm probably going to get in trouble for this but here it goes so British soccer tends to be um, you know kind of like the most talented athletic guys out there yeah and you know other like kind of continental 
European. This this is probably more for the national teams, but like continental European teams, like the Germans, Italians, the French, the Spanish, tend to play a more uh, flowing game with a lot more sure. passing. Uh, that's just the style I appreciate more. Um, you know, kind of the epitome of that is Barcelona and the Spanish teams with the the so called tiki taka which I means something to the effect of small passes uh, around the pitch. It's a really beautiful style. If you watch Dortmund play, they play a beautiful flowing style of, of soccer, which is just, just amazing to watch. Um, you know, there's less of that in the premier league. Sure. So um, I, I, I tend to stay, I mean, and certainly, you know, not like, you know, the, the England national team that they, they, they don't play like that at all. So uh, it's just a matter of style. I mean, I, I like the, the passing, and the flow of the game. So that's why I will, you know, continue to, you know, and, and like I said, it's not like every match in the Bundesliga is great because sure. man, I, I, I could not watch. I, I had to turn that game off. It was, it was like just so the is it like... of bad soccer going to my kids was like, not a good thing <laughs> Pro- in my house. Protecting your children from German protecting soccer. my children who aren't even really watching, but you, you know what I mean? Right. So is it like analogous to like watching the San Antonio Spurs play back in the day where they may not have like the best talent, but like it's so technically fun to watch? Yeah, actually, that's a great analogy. So you think about the NBA now and like definitely San Antonio, but you think the way that the Warriors play a lot of passing, a lot of skill. Um, Whereas do you think when when I was growing up uh, watching the NBA in the 80s, there was a lot more butt ball posting up (laughs) Charles Barkley. Butt ball? Butt ball. What on earth is that? Oh, you know, like guys, I mean, there was a lot more post-up play back then. Okay. Or okay. understand stood analytics and just, you know, the efficiency of corner three-point shots. Yeah. Um, you know, and, the, you know, for a long time, like, I really liked college basketball because you could yeah. find teams that, like, really moved the ball, a lot of passing, beautiful offense. Um, that has really come to the NBA because the NBA has adopted analytics and, and uh, well, They've adopted a better style of play. It's not just analytics. So analytics right. played a role in that they understand the value of the three-point shot, and you know, uh, a passing game is a much better way of you know getting those types of shots, and and it's less about a dominating big man, like it was when I was growing up in the '80s and '90s. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I would I would say like you know, uh, England the English style is a little bit more like the NBA in the '80s, and and uh, the continental Europe is more like. Uh, you know, what you see with the Spurs and, and the Warriors now. Well, speaking of the NBA, we actually have a plan now from the NBA to come back. Uh, Adrian Wojnarowski was talking about this today, where apparently the NBA is going to pass a proposal to begin their season once again on July 31st, where each team, there'll be 22 teams that go, uh, nine teams, I believe, in the East and 13 in the West. I slid, the, the details are slipped, regardless, 22 teams going there, and they'll play eight regular season games to finish things up. There could be a a play-in tournament for the eighth seed at some point, and they're going to be all in Orlando. And, Ed, they did not take your uh, single elimination tur- <laughs> tournament idea. I am sad about that, but we have a plan for some sports in the NBA once again at the end of July. Yeah, it's going to be nice to see some NBA. I'm definitely excited about that. But just, you know, I mean, do a single elimination tournament. See see how it goes. Yeah. Plus, I mean, with this plan, you're literally talking about the finals ending in October. Yeah. So when is next season going to start? Yeah. December? I mean, you got to give these guys some time off. So they were saying, like, Christmas Day might be opening day, which I think would be pretty cool. Yeah. No, I mean, I think that that's all right. But you... Yeah. But you shorten that season and, and whatever. I'm not saying that I need an 82 game regular season for the NBA right. because I don't. But, you know, can you imagine late July you have some kind of, uh, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I mean, you could, in a couple of weeks you could do a single elimination tournament, um, be done by the middle of August, and then potentially start your season on time in October right. again. Try that out. I bet the ratings would be bananas, like we know they are for the NCAA tournament. Yeah, um, I think it would push the NBA to to institute that you know that midseason tournament that they've been talking about for a long time. Um, I wonder they they're not going to change the end of the game, are they? You know, like playing to a so, final, taking the score and playing to a final score in the fourth quarter. I like didn't see game. any like definitive proposals on changing things. I saw that they were talking about potentially trying to institute something to actually give teams a home court advantage. And right. 
Like I don't, I don't, I think I get the incentive to do that because you are talking about playoffs where there should, in theory, be an advantage to the higher seeds. But like, isn't the advantage by itself getting to face a lower seed? Like, is that not advantage enough? Right. Like, I don't, I don't want to alter the actual game. I yeah. think that might be too far for me, at least. Right. Yeah. No, I hear you. I hear you on that. And the other thing about this problem, right? Like, if you're the Bucks who are expected to make the finals, you're going to be away from home for three months. Yeah. That's a October long time 12th. Being... What? Yeah. The October 12th is when they want to wrap things up. And like from a from a content perspective, the idea of having NFL, PGA, NASCAR, NBA all going baseball all going at the same right. time, September's going to suck. It's yeah. going to be terrible, but uh, it'll be fun to have the sports back, but like from a work perspective, oh my gosh, I am already dreading what that will be like. Right, so we could have the NFL and then plenty of reason to do a second pod every week. That's true. Even even there's no college football, right? Yeah, exactly. So, so we'll have plenty to talk about. That's yeah, not going to be an issue as long as there's not a second wave that quashes everything. Which, hey, you know, hey, we're not talking about that on the show. I didn't say the the <laughs> SW word. I didn't say it. That was not me. It was some other phantom on the show. We're all good. <laughs> If you want more discussion about broad betting, uh, well, last week we had Ed Miller on to talk about uh, the book he co-authored with Matthew Davidow, The Logic of Sports Betting. Would highly recommend that. Uh, that discussion with Ed, everything we discussed on there, still relevant, so make sure you check out that discussion with Ed by searching for Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcasts. We are on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, you name it, we are there. And if you like what you hear from Austin, Ed, other Ed, whatever it may be, make sure you subscribe and leave us a uh, review as well. But we're going to get to Austin Cass and talk about the EPL in just one second. First, UFC 250 is coming up on June 6th on Saturday, and there is no better way to bet the fights than on FanDuel Sportsbook. Right now, new users can get an exclusive odds boost when you sign up. Just join FanDuel Sportsbook, and they will boost Amanda Nunez's odds to beat Felicia Spencer from, I think it's actually like minus 800 or minus 7, I think it is 800 now, to plus 250. That means you can bet up to $20 on the favorite to win up to $50. To claim your exclusive odds boost, just sign up for FanDuel Sportsbook and deposit to see the odds. 21 plus and present in New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Indiana, West Virginia, and Colorado. First online wager only except in Colorado. Must wager in designated offer market. $10 minimum first deposit required. $50 max bonus. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. In Indiana, call 1-800-9-WITH-IT. In West Virginia, visit one 800 gambler.net and in Colorado call 1-800-522-4700. Let's bring on Austin Cass now. You can find him on Twitter at Austin Cass, A U S T A N K A S. He is a number fire editor covering the EPL and a whole lot of other stuff for the site. Uh so make sure you follow Austin on Twitter, but let's pause now to get his thoughts on betting on the EPL. Covering the present. Let's welcome Austin Cass into covering the spread to talk about the English Premier League. Austin, I know nothing about soccer, so I am going to lean on you here fully. So I am glad that you are here today to educate me. How are you doing? I'm doing really well. How are you guys? Very good. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Like I said, like I know nothing, so it's it's nice to have you uh, and Ed know soccer too. I guess football. I don't know. Like regardless, to educate me because. I don't really know what's going on, but Austin, it's been three months since we've seen the English Premier League. Have you been watching Bundesliga recently to kind of get your fix in? Yeah, I have. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's really crazy. I was just thinking before I came on that for a lot of the top players at top teams, they their off season of the, the summer is international soccer. So for some of these guys, they probably haven't had three months off of, of from the sport since they were kids, you know? So there's just so many variables like you guys talked about with Alex on the Bundesliga pod that, you know, people, people just don't know how things are going to go, you know, and that's kind of part of the fun of watching it. So I guess we'll yeah, see what yeah. happens. It's going to be really interesting. And I could see there being some rust for sure. And it's, it's weird to see rust in professional athletes, like watching NASCAR, like, 
there have been dudes just like wrecking like for no reason it's been awesome because they just seem human and, and tom brady golfing terribly it's all humanizing which is <laughs> which is nice um so austin we had alex heinard on as you mentioned when the bundesliga restarted to ask him about resources that he leans on for betting and things like that so we got alex's perspective but what about you we want to get multiple perspectives when it comes to betting process so we can find what works best for us uh which sites and metrics do you utilize uh how do you decide where you want to go and how do you judge team strength when trying to make bets uh, I really lean heavily on expected goals, which is a um, kind of a newer metric that keeps getting better and better every year. But uh, different websites and different models account for different things. But it's basically, um, it's just a better measurement than the final score. Typically, kind of like point differential for NFL, but um, it's just. Uh, kind of accounts for the quantity and quality of shots a team has in a game and tells you how many goals they should have scored, you know, which is not perfect, but sometimes that's a better representation than the final score line. So like a really good example of this is a, a match from earlier this year, Manchester City hosted Tottenham and the final score was two to two, but Tottenham had three shots, only two on goal. So scored on both of their shots. Man City had 30 shots and 10 on goal. And the expected, the expected goals was 3.0 to 0.2. Yeah, so <laughs> City really crushed them, but each team got a point, you know. So obviously that's kind of an outlier, but throughout the course of a season, soccer is just such a low scoring, uh, like a random game, a little bit like hockey, that you can get some misleading results like that that will maybe make you think a team is better than they actually are. And betting markets are really sharp as you guys know and typically account for a lot of these things but sometimes you can find some value by looking at expected goals yeah i actually love expected goals you know there was a, a bayern munich versus dortmund uh last weekend bayern won one nothing on the road but it was really a close game and i thought dortmund actually dominated big parts of it and uh you look at expected goals it was 0.8 to 0.8 uh, perfectly even match. So, uh, love that. Love that you're looking at that. Um, Austin, when you when you are betting soccer, I mean, how much of it is the analytics and the expected goals, and how much of it is other factors that are more difficult to quantify when you're looking for bets? Yeah, I would say expected goals is a big thing. Obviously, like how the lines are set and how teams are priced um, is a, as part of it. I could think, you know, Brighton. You know, maybe they have a really good shot against Arsenal, but then the lines come out and they're not really a big underdog. And it's like, well, there's not a lot of value there. Um, I think kind of a big, something that can be a big value in soccer is that they don't release the starting lineups till an hour before the game. And the coaches are like Belichick style about <laughs> not leaking any information. So if you can see a starting lineup and maybe a team feels like a really weakened side, you're going to have to get on your computer, your app or whatever, and very quickly. But sometimes there's a window right there where you can get a team where they were priced as everyone assumed they were going to play their best. And that's not what they fielded. But, uh, yeah, in general, I think expected goals and then just recent form, I think, is really important. You know, whether it's a coaching change, which happens very frequently in soccer, not it's a lot different than our sports here. They'll they'll sack a coach after three or four weeks if things aren't going well. Whereas you know, Jay Gruden will get five years or whatever <laughs> in Washington NFL. But um, yeah, I think recent form like players coming back from injury. There's like tangible things you can say. Here's why this team's playing better, maybe. But I think you can also look at that and see, which I think we're going to get into Arsenal a little bit later. But you know, they're a team that has a new manager and it's like his fourth month. And I think there's a narrative that. Arsenal's playing a lot better. Things are kind of turning around, but if you look at expected goals, like that's not really happening at all. Hmm. And so I think sometimes that that narrative is maybe leaked into the betting market for their first match back here. But there's also a lot of other variables, including the three months off and everything as well. But yeah, I think if if you can uh, kind of hone in on how a team is playing recently and if they're doing better, is there a reason why, or is it just kind of a random couple of games or what's going on 
So would you say when betting on soccer, it's important to be around when lineups come out so you can react to them? Is that kind of something you would try to make time to plan around so you can react if there is a major change in the projected lineup and try to get an inefficient line there? Absolutely. Yeah. Usually the I'm in Eastern time where I live. So 10, 10 o'clock is when matches start. So nine o'clock is when lineups will come out. So yeah, usually I'll be ready to roll and they'll get the clubs will tweet them out from their official Twitter accounts. And yeah, it, it's really incredible how uh, um, they'll keep things under wraps. Really. If, if, you know, if there's an injury situation, you'll kind of know, like sure. maybe this star isn't going to play, but there'll be times where a guy's healthy and they'll just give him a, a game off kind of like what happens in the NBA, you know? So, um, yeah, sometimes you can pounce on a window right there and you you can see odds like shift pretty drastically in a 15 minute stretch on Saturday morning, sometimes based off of lineups. Interesting. All right. So the premier league is slated to return on June 17th. Finally have an actual date for that. And, it's been a three-month layoff between matches, and you've kind of alluded to this and how there are some unknown there. Does that worry you from a betting perspective? Because it effectively is giving us less information. You don't know about the form like you were talking about. Does that worry you and make you more hesitant to dive into the markets, or are you starved enough by this point with three months off where it's just like, hey, who cares? I'm going to dive in anyway. Um, probably a little bit of both. Yeah. You know, when I'm thinking rationally, I think – you know, maybe I should take it easy here. Let's see how things are going. But then the morning out, it's like, oh, soccer's back. Like, let's get involved. So, um, yeah, I think what what we've seen in the Bundesliga so far, which is obviously a small sample, but kind of the only thing we have to go off of for what teams could look like after a break like this, is uh, the home field advantage has been like non-existent, really. So. I think that's something that we could look at in the Premier League because there there won't be fans there in the Premier League. Premier League actually is going to play some games. They haven't finalized everything, but they're actually going to play some games at neutral sites as well, which the Bundesliga isn't doing as far as I know. So that could lessen the home field advantage even more. So, yeah, it'll be really interesting when when betting lines come out for future games, like how, how much is that being factored in? Cause they very quickly have adjusted for that for Bundesliga games. So that'll be something really interesting to watch for. Excellent. Um, you talked a little bit about kind of uh, current form. Um, where, what do you think about current forms? Are there any teams that were playing particularly well or particularly poorly before the break that you're keeping track of? Yeah, so Manchester United was playing really well before the break. They were unbeaten in their last 11, won eight of those games. And their last Premier League game before the hiatus was a home 2-0 win over Manchester City, a really big win for them. And United really have it all to play for. They've uh, got a shot to get in the top four, which is something I wouldn't have thought was possible around Christmas time. So getting in the top four, getting in the Champions League means more money. And then obviously they get to play in the Champions League next year, which is a, a big appeal for players now. So maybe um, they can attract better players in the offseason or something like that. But they had a new signing in the January transfer window named Bruno Fernandez, who has come in and had a huge impact on their team. And they were kind of playing shorthanded um, when things shut down. And they should have Paul Pogba and Marcus Rashford back, two of their best players. So... We're looking at a team who was kind of playing their best soccer of the season when things got shut down, and now they're getting two of their very best players back. So, you know, I guess that could go both ways, but if it goes the positive way, we could be looking at, like, a team that's playing as well as anybody in the league here the the past or the last nine games if they can keep the form going. Interesting. And uh, I think – it's always good to get good players back. So I think that definitely is uh, impactful for sure with them coming out of the break. Uh, looking at the larger picture here, it seems like Liverpool pretty much has the league wrapped up and motivation matters. At least, you know, in the NFL, we're talking week 17, things suck then. Like it's really tough to know who cares and who doesn't. Does Liverpool having that wrapped up impact motivation for other teams in the league or is there still enough on the line with those top four finishes with stuff like relegation where we can expect most teams to still put forth a regular effort? Yeah, I think there's enough on the line for, for most teams. Um, 
the system and the way they do things over there with promotion and relegation and having top four Champions League and then uh, there's actually Europa League after that. It really kind of, with the <laughs> exception of a few teams in the middle of the table, everybody does have something to play for at the end of the year. Um, so yeah, I would think Liverpool will be an interesting case because they're out of the Champions League and they've already basically wrapped up the Premier League. So they really, they won't have anything to play for. So it'll be interesting. They could, you know, play some younger guys and kind of start building, use this almost as like a, a preseason into next year, which is going to start basically right after this year. But for most teams, they should be plenty motivated and have 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 a, a lot to play for here in the final few weeks. So I don't think that's going to be that big of a deal. So one of the best things about European soccer is the idea of relegation. The bottom teams get sent down to uh, the next lower league. Um, FanDuel, FanDuel doesn't have uh, those odds up for relegation yet, but uh, give us a sense for what you're thinking about which teams are going to get relegated. Yeah, so right now Norwich City's in last. They're in 20th, and they're four points behind Aston Villa, who's played one fewer game. So Norwich City's probably done. I mean, in all I could, and any any odds you were looking at would have them as the favorite to go down, and I wouldn't I wouldn't bet against that at all. But <laughs> the other five teams will be Brighton, West Ham, Watford, Bournemouth, and Aston Villa, and I those five will be you know fighting for two spots or fighting to stay out of two spots. Um, I think you could make a very easy argument for any of those teams to get relegated. Um, of that group, I'd think Aston Villa and Bournemouth are the ones most likely to go down, and they would probably be priced that way. Um, Aston Villa have allowed 56 goals the most in the league, and their expected goal differential is uh, minus 25.9, which is the worst in the league. So you actually make a pretty strong case for them, uh, not Norwich being the worst team in the league. Norwich's expected goal differential is actually just minus 12.8, so they've been pretty unlucky, but they probably just have too steep a mountain to climb right now to get out. Um, Bournemouth are a really amazing story and they've climbed multiple levels to get to the Premier League. I've stayed in the Premier League, but they may have kind of come to the end of the road. Uh, the one bright spot for them is they've got Steve Cook, a defender, and then uh, David Brooks, one of their key play playmakers, coming back from injury. Brooks hasn't played at all this year, but last year he looked like one of the best young players in the league. So maybe he could be enough to get him out. But like I said, I think Bournemouth and, and Aston Villa go down, but they'll probably be priced that way. From a betting perspective, I think the West Ham would be really enticing. They're in 16th right now, but they've been really bad by expected goal differential, which has them 18th at minus 20.2. Um, they have head-to-head -head dates with Watford and Aston Villa, two of the other relegation-threatened teams. Those are two of their last three games. So those are just going to be like colossal, extremely nervy games for both of those teams. So I think West Ham is a team who I'd be willing to put some money on them getting relegated, even if I think it's unlikely, because it definitely could happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for so sure. Keep an eye on that, for sure. Hey, Go ahead, Ed. Hey, Austin. So you did mention that Aston Villa has the worst uh, expected goal differential uh, I was wondering, do you have those numbers handy? And I'd love to see what's at the top of the table in terms of, I mean, Liverpool's obviously far ahead with Man City and Leicester City after that. Do you have those numbers handy? Yeah, I do. Yep. So I, for expected goal differential, I usually use uh, football reference. It's just FB reference because the other football reference is NFL. But they get their expected goals. They use Stats Bomb's expected goal model, which I think is pretty good. And, um, yeah, so... It's pretty crazy, but at the top of the table, expected goal differential per 90 minutes. Man City's actually first, and mm. Chelsea's second, and Liverpool's third. Wow. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, it, it's really interesting. You know, it's one of the faults of expected goals, which I probably should have said this early, is that it measures, like, if they give you 0 .4, 0 0.4 expected goals on a shot, that's for the average player, you know, so... Somebody right. like Lionel you know, Messi or Mo Salah for Liverpool, like they're going to outperform that that number probably consistently. So that's maybe a little bit of what's happened to Liverpool, um, and why their their goal differential is kind of different. Their their overall goal differential is plus twenty eight, which is tops in the league. But 
the expected goal differential is only 17.6. Um, so, yeah, but betting markets are obviously factoring these things into account because before the Champions League knockout round, um, Liverpool was playing Atletico Madrid, Real Madrid was Real Madrid was playing Man City. And Man City was actually the favorite in futures markets to win the Champions League, even though they had what looked like on paper a tougher matchup. And they were about 25 points behind Liverpool in the table, yet they were still the favorite. And it's something that, you know, I think to maybe outsiders would be really head scratching. Like, how could Liverpool not be the favorite? Well, as it played out, like Liverpool actually got knocked out by Atletico Madrid in their round of 16 match, and Man City won the first leg and looks like they're going to go through. And so, yeah, obviously betting markets are taking some of these advanced metrics into account when they, when they look at things and expected goals, isn't perfect by any stretch, but I do think it's, it's a really good way to kind of peek behind the curtain a little bit and see what maybe, you know, deserved is the right word, but what, how teams actually are playing and not just looking at the, the final result. I think that's always yeah, key. Like, I talk about that for NASCAR, too. Like, with average running position, like, you want to know what actually went into it. And you don't want to, like, because when you look at just one number, it can be really misleading. And I think that expected goals and stuff like that is going to take into account a lot of those things. Uh, I want to stay on the subject here of expected goals because I admittedly know almost nothing about the FA Cup. Uh, and there are FA Cup odds up at FanDuel Sportsbook. Can you use some of these metrics? I know it's like comparing apples to oranges at some point, but like, can you use some of those advanced metrics in trying to predict the FA Cup as well? Or is there such a big discrepancy where you kind of have to make too large of an extrapolation there? Um, because the FA Cup is just a, a knockout tournament, I think it's probably... It's, it's just really random. It's prone to randomness, especially in the early rounds. The the bigger clubs may kind of throw out a second team, basically, because some of them would view it as uh, just not as big of a deal as I think the FA Cup used to be. Um, and the same goes for lesser teams. Uh, you know, a team like... Norwich City is still alive in the FA Cup, but these extra matches that they've been playing throughout the year in the FA Cup could actually have hindered them in the Premier League. And I think if you ask their owner, coaches, players, fans, would you rather get to the FA Cup semifinals and play at Wembley or get 17th and stay in the league, they would say 17th and stay in the league. And I know the owner would for sure. So, um, yeah, I think that's something that teams probably struggle with. And those smaller teams who don't have the depth on the bench that the bigger teams do, I think that's a real conundrum for them. But, yeah, the the FA Cup is just kind of, uh, I would compare it to like the NCAA tournament where it can be really random. The draw matters uh, because the draw is also random. So you could get, um, you know, two small teams playing in like a, a round of 16 game and two really big teams on the other side of the bracket. So um, I think expected goals and, and things like that are, are stuff you can look for. It's a lot harder to find expected goal information for teams outside of the top flight. So like the championship, which is what they call their second tier, it'd be a lot harder to find reliable expected goals information for a team from that level. So that would make it difficult as well. Okay, cool. So I'm learning here. This is good. I like this very, very much. Now, Austin, before we let you go, there are a couple of games posted up on FanDuel Sportsbook for the EPL. Coming out of the break, uh, we talked already about Arsenal a little bit and Aston Villa. Uh, we got Man City versus Arsenal, Aston Villa against Sheffield United. Do you see any numbers you like between those two matches uh, right now based on the odds at FanDuel Sportsbook? Yeah, so Man City's uh, two, minus 280 to win at home against Arsenal. And by every metric statistic you want to find, Man City is a lot better than Arsenal. And for me, Man City, I think, might be the best team in the world. Um, and they're getting Imeric Laporte back from injury, or at least they, they're expected to. And he's a huge piece for them. Um, with a, Yeah, like I said, I think they're the best team in the world with them. Without them, their defense is like a shell of itself, and they can lose to some teams that you wouldn't expect a team of their caliber to lose to. But... Um, we touched on this earlier. Arsenal uh, 
I think the narrative is that their new coach has really impacted things positively, and I'm not quite sure that's the same. But if you look at the results, they've got just one loss in their last 13 matches across all competitions. That's pretty great. But they had a very favorable schedule in that span, and they drew at Chelsea and had a home win over Man United in that time. But on the expected goals in the Chelsea game, they actually lost by 2.4 expected goals, but they won. So it was really a match they were very fortunate to win. Um, and I think maybe the the narrative with Mikel Arteta, their new coach, having an impact and just the three-month layoff and so much uncertainty maybe has the market a little tepid to like put City at too high of a number in that game. But I would say it should be closer to like 350 or 400. Um, and like I said, it's at City, which may not really matter much now with with no fans in the stadium. But I would say that's a game I would love. It's It's never that fun to bet on somebody at minus 280, but I would take Man City, I think, all day there. And then the other match is Sheffield United and Aston Villa. It's it's uh, at Villa, but Sheffield United's 130 to win, plus 130, and I think very similar situation to what we just talked about. Sheffield United, by every metric, has been much better than Aston Villa. Both of those teams are promoted teams this year to the Premier League. Sheffield United's in seventh, um, and have has had an incredible season. It's a really great story. And if Leicester City hadn't won the league in 2015, I think that kind of like ruined it for teams like Wolverhampton last year or Sheffield United this year. They're having really remarkable seasons um, as underdogs. But uh, like we mentioned earlier, Aston Villa is minus 20. They have a 27. Sorry, Aston Villa and uh, Sheffield United, by goal differential, expected goal differential, there's 26 goal difference between the two teams. By actual goal differential, there's 27 goal difference. Um, yeah, one Sheffield United's in seventh in the table, Aston Villa's in 19th. It seems like Sheffield United should probably be like plus 100 or maybe even like a pushing over that a little bit. Yeah. And maybe there's just like I said, some hesitancy from markets to really put a strong number out there because you don't want to get sure. burnt. But I would take Sheffield United pretty much all day. The only hesitation I would have is kind of the motivation figure or thing you talked about earlier, just fighting for their lives. And every game is going to be huge for them. They basically have uh, 10 like cup finals the rest of the season. Every game is so big. Any tie, any point they can get could just be the difference between them staying up and going down. So they'll have the motivation, but Sheffield United is also fighting for a, a Europa League spot and they have an outside shot of getting in the top four. So they're not exactly going to be going through the motions either. So that that uh, that narrative might be a little bit overblown. But yeah, I would take the two favorites and the two games coming back like pretty comfortably. Yeah, and you were saying minus 280 is not super fun on Man City, but like an inefficient number is an inefficient number. Like... If, you, if it can get you positive expected value, take that all day for sure. That is Austin Cass. Make sure you follow him on Twitter, at Austin Cass. Again, he is a number fire editor. You can find his work over at numberfire.com. Austin, I appreciate you swinging by. Uh, fun conversation. It's good to, for me to learn sports. I know nothing about so I appreciate it, and hopefully we can talk to you again soon. Yeah, sounds good. Thank you guys for having me on. Absolutely. Thank you. Covering the future. One final big thank you to Austin Cass for swinging by and breaking down the EPL. Find him on Twitter at Austin Cass, A U S T A N K A S. And Ed, he talked about expected goals. And the made me think about discussions we had during the fall. Don't you have a model that also backs out an expected score for college football and NFL games, too? Yeah, I mean, I. I, I do, um, yeah. and I don't think that's a direct analogy. But, I mean, I think expected goals is is part of a long trend of trying to come up with statistics that better capture what happened in the game than just the final score. Yeah. Um, so I would say the earliest example is is fifth in baseball. So, yeah. you know, uh, pitchers have had earned run average for a long time, and we used that for decades. And then uh, I think it was the 90s, definitely by Moneyball, but – um, it was chronicle of Moneyball, but but this guy was like, well, um, he came up basically with FIP, right? Uh, yeah. We found out that like pitchers have less control than we think about what happens when the bat, uh, when the ball leaves a player's bat and lands in the field of play. So basically, batting average on balls in play was 
pretty relatively uniform across pitchers. And so that meant like what pitchers could really control were walks and strikeouts. And um, so that's how they came up with fielding independent pitching. Uh, you really look at walk and strikeout rates in order to figure out, you know, how good a pitcher is. And that's still, you know, a better metric than, than ERA. Like if you find a saber nutrition person like writing about ERA, like find someone else. <laughs> right. <laughs> and so, so we do, you know, I mean, we do this in all kinds of sports and I would say in football, um, you know, the biggest thing is like, instead of looking at points scored, like we're looking at success rate of offenses because the work that Bill Connolly has done is show that success rate is very predictive. It's very sticky um, from early to late season. And uh, that is a good thing. I mean, that's, that's kind of what we want. And so I, I just think expected goals is, is in, it, it's very similar to that. Uh, and you know, it's, it's basically saying like, uh, you know, how many goals should you have scored given a shot from a particular position? And I, to my understanding, like it's, it's specific to the type of shot too. Yeah. So more likely to score if you shoot it with your foot than if you get a header. And it, it considers all things like that. So if you get a header from like um, uh, far away, that's unlikely to score a goal. If you shoot it with your foot from the same spot, you're more likely to score a goal. If you shoot it with your foot from like two feet away from the goal line, you're very likely to score a goal. Right. And that, and that's part of what I was saying earlier with the style. Like the style in which teams like strive to get these tap in goals that's kind of like the spanish style the german style yeah. uh when you watch like more epl games there's more guys like cranking it from outside the box sure. which is like my least favorite play in the game <laughs> that's me on fifa just trying to <laughs> launch it in there and see what happens uh i am so bad at fifa that uh my friend james he would always play as like some random country and then i'd play as like the spanish national team in order to try to even it out i would still lose but i would lose by less so well, that's where i'm coming from here yeah if you're playing with a spanish national team you gotta you gotta strive for those tap and goals that's right i don't i do not believe me that is uh that is not happening but i think the other thing that's yeah that's probably why you lose right because the code knows that those guys don't practice that ever but i also can't get to the goal <laughs> <laughs> like, in order to shoot a, a, a close shot, you have to get there. I'm not getting there. Believe sure. me. I'm going to turn over before then. So it's a dilemma for sure. But going back to, you were talking about FIP. I think that the fun thing about that is also tracking the evolution of advanced stats like this. Because yeah. FIP was obviously a big breakthrough. But now we have things like Skill Interactive ERA, which account for home run rate, which is not accounted for yeah. in, in FIP and stuff like that. We have all the, the baseball savant data, the, the stat cast data that shows us the expected batting average on a base hit, which can kind of account for things like batting average on balls in play and how yeah. much hard contact pitches allow. Yeah. So the evolution of stats is really fascinating. And um, yeah, I'm sure, sure that soccer is probably going through a very similar phase right now too. Yep. All right, let's move on to covering the future for today. And Ed, you want to talk some NFL and yeah. talk mm -hmm. about, I think it's, we could call this Aaron Rodgers syndrome. You want to talk about interception rate yeah. and the impact it's having across the NFL as it's been changing throughout the years. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've always marveled at the efficiency of passing in the NFL. Started when I read Blindside many, many years ago by Michael Lewis. And we know that passing is very efficient in terms of yards per play and, and continues to get efficient. Um, the rules changed in 1978, uh, which made passing easier. So the offensive linemen could now use their hands and defensive backs couldn't touch receivers anywhere on the field anymore. Um, and you saw a steady increase in yards per pass attempt, which is a stat that includes uh, negative yards from sacks. But in the NFL, like yards per carry has pretty much been steady since uh, 1978. But when I looked at this uh, a couple years ago, that wasn't the most remarkable thing I found. The most remarkable thing was the interception rate in the NFL. It was 5% in 1978 and has pretty much dropped uh, kind of linearly since then. In 2019, uh, the interception rate in the NFL was 2.3%. That's remarkably low. So not only is passing getting more efficient, despite you know an evolution of this game, uh, but it's getting safer as well. So I was kind of wondering whether this held in college as well, uh, and it, it does. So when you look at FPS games from 2005 to 2009, the interception rate was 3.24%. And if you look at the last five years, from 2015 to 2019, uh, it was 2.74%. So it's a half a percent 
And, you know, it's why, why does this matter? Why does this matter when you're betting on games? Well, I think it makes dominant teams less dominant. So part of what we know happens in college football was some work that David Hale of ESPN did. And he found that one third of turnovers um, happen uh, when it only a third of turnovers happen when it, a team is ahead on the scoreboard. So the vast majority of turnovers happen when a team is behind. So, and you're more likely to throw picks when you're when you're down on the scoreboard. But if passing is in, in general getting safer, I would expect it to actually get safer even when you're behind on the scoreboard, whether that's scheme or, or whatever the coaches are doing. Um, that could, uh, I think, you know, sometimes when you get bigger margins of victory in some of these lopsided games, a lot of that's coming from the stronger team getting an interception because the weaker team is down and desperate and, and trying to throw the ball. So that was kind of, uh, you know, the motivation for doing that. The pick rate is certainly declining in college football. And it's just one of the many things I'm, I'm looking at uh, in football as we head into the next season. And I think that the interception rate discussion is fascinating because it made it might have become almost like overemphasized interceptions at, at a certain point because a lot of the discussion that you know smart people like Eric Eager have had about Aaron Rodgers are that he doesn't challenge enough in short windows or in small windows right. leading to a lower interception rate but it also makes things like his overall efficiency be lower because he's not getting as many yards per attempt right and are we going to see a swing here potentially where we see quarterbacks start to open things back up and be more aggressive, potentially increasing that interception rate? Or do you think this trend will continue where we continue to see quarterbacks just try to cut out picks altogether? Yeah. So a couple of thoughts. Uh, first, you should not play to minimize your interception rate. Yeah. Uh, I think that's what kind of Dr. Eager is talking about. Like yep. you optimize your chance to win the game and you know dumping it off is not is not the way to do that um second thought is that are we going to continue to see the pick rate decline no because i feel like th there's i mean part of what i'm looking for is like the base interception rate right, right. the interception rate's never going to go to zero and the reason right. is because that you know, no quarterback is perfect at throwing the ball. And even if they were perfect, like these defenses are good and you're going to get tip passes that fall in the hands of the other team, even if your quarterback is Drew Brees. So so part of the thing I'm looking for is like, what is like the base, you know, like in, in perfect conditions, you're up in the sure. game, like you're not trying to stretch yourself. What is the interception rate? You know, it looks like it's about 2% from, from stuff I've been doing. And that number doesn't actually really seem to change much between – college and the pros um so yeah uh you know there's a certain you know like the overall interception rate probably won't get that low just because some teams have to be down in games sure. by definition so you're going to have those attempts that like increase uh your turnover rate but you know turnovers are a huge part of football uh and i'm just trying to shed a little bit more light on that as we go into the next season for both nfl and college and obviously, interception rate would have a big impact in the way you view teams that are underdogs, teams that are heavy yep. favored, things like that. So a lot of implications from studying things like interception rate. For my cover in the future, I want to talk about Sunday's NASCAR race in Atlanta because NASCAR's window is like the one of the few shows in town. It's getting close. So let's let's keep on going here while we still can. Kevin Harvick is the favorite. He is plus 460 at FanDuel Sportsbook. Nobody else is shorter than 7-1. to one. And I don't think that's wrong. Harvick, if you look at my model, is in a tier of his own, honestly. Um, I am at least tempted to go at him despite being plus 460. That's how good he is in my model based on the current form in the track history. But I also think Joey Logano is interesting at 9-1. to one. I have been on him a lot this year, but I'm going back to him once again on Sunday. Logano is second in my model behind only Kevin Harvick. And despite that, there are three other drivers with odds shorter than Logano's. Chase Elliott, there's like this, this second tier of drivers behind Harvick who are all above the rest of the fold where there's another drop off. Chase Elliott is the only other guy in that grouping who is in that same model as Logano. He's seven to one. Logano's nine to one. And if I had to guess why Logano's odds are longer, the reasoning for that is probably because Logano has never won in Atlanta, but as we know, finishes can be really deceptive. The, the Cup Series goes here just one time per year now, so it's a smaller sample, but also finishes are deceptive, and Logano was really fast in last year's Atlanta race. He led 22 laps. Uh, there was a poorly timed caution 
that really hurt both him and his teammate Ryan Blaney, pinned them a lap down. So Logano finished 23rd, but his average running position in that race was 9th. He had been that uh, that high or better from an average running per- position perspective in five of the past seven Atlanta races. So he's been good at this track. He just hasn't won. His teammate, though, Brad Keselowski, did win that race last year and showed the team had really good speed and a good setup for that track. And that's good for Logano. But I think the bigger thing is the current form. It's obviously really, really good for him. He won in Las Vegas. This year, another race at a one and a half mile track. He has had a top nine average running position in four of the five races since the end of the COVID 19 layoff. And one of those was a fourth place mark in Charlotte, another one and a half mile track. And a top five average running position means you are in contention to win a race. And Logano had that at Charlotte, which is a sister track to Atlanta. Logano hasn't been as good at the tracks uh, like Fontana and Darlington with heavy tire wear, which is what Atlanta is, so that's a bit concerning, but he has still had a top 10 average running position in two of those three races, so he's not been elite, but he hasn't been bad. So Logano, 9-1, to one, I think that number is really good. I also do not mind his teammate, Brad Keselowski. He is now 10-1. to one. He actually opened at plus 750, so I'm not sure why he lengthened. He's won two of the past three races. He is really good at this track. I'm not sure why he lengthened. 10 to 1 is interesting there. William Byron is a longer shot. Uh, He's 32 to 1 to win, plus 950 to finish on the podium. I think that's intriguing. But of all the bets on the board for Atlanta, Joey Logano at 9 to 1, I think, is the best number I see available. Ed, uh, any NASCAR viewing for you yet, or is it just Bundesliga still? Not yet, not yet, but, okay. but I like how you're talking about finding these underlying stats of, uh, you know, average running position. Yep. It's, uh, it's a theme in, in sports, predictive sports analytics in general. Yeah, I mean, it's, the, it's, it's basically the same thing as expected goals, effectively. Like, it's not yeah. one-to-one, yeah. but, like, we're looking for what a team or a driver actually did rather than w- what the finishing score or finishing position was. And right. there's a lot of flukiness in where drivers finish, and I think that it's really important to make sure you take advantage of that. Uh, what do you got going on for this week over at the Power Rank, Ed? Yeah, I'm still cranking away on some long-term projects, so you know nothing too new. But uh, you can always uh, sign up for my free email newsletter to uh, you know for all the content that I have and uh, predictions once we get back into football season. All right, that is uh, thepowerrank.com. Make sure you follow Ed on Twitter at the Power Rank as well. Check out all of his podcasts on the Football Analytics Show. I am at Jim Sonnes, J I M S A N N E S. We have a UFC 250 DFS podcast already posted on the Number Fire Daily Fantasy podcast feed. NASCAR podcast coming tomorrow at 10 a.m. on Thursday. So make sure you subscribe to that one too, but also subscribe to Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcasts. So you can get these right when they are posted. Big thank you to Calvin Theobald, our video producer, for running the video side of things here today. Thank you, Cal, as always. Thank you to Austin Cass, our uh, wonderful guest for breaking down the EPL, educating me about uh, everything there is to know about soccer. I appreciate that, Austin. And finally, a thank you to everyone for tuning in for today. I know it's been uh, a rough couple of weeks, so we appreciate you coming here to take your mind off of things and hopefully... um, You are safe, you are healthy, everything is going well for you in your life as well. Hopefully you'll be back with us once again next week. This has been Covering the Spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. 